Welcome to today's episode of 219 Green Connect, where we explore topics about the environment and green living in Northwest Indiana. For past show archives, news, and upcoming events, you can check out our website at 219greenconnect.com or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Listeners to our live show today can phone in at 805-243-1323 to post questions or to join us on the live call. I'm Kathy Sippel. I'm your host, and with me today... I have head of school at Avicenna Academy in Crown Point, Amanda Arceo. Did I get that all right, Amanda? Yes, you did. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Amanda was pointed out to me as an example of a local innovator when it comes to living green by uh, the Legacy Foundation. They, They told me that they had worked with Amanda to get a learning garden set up at your academy, and I wondered if you could share some of uh, the story of how that garden came to be and uh, what what the kids are learning. Absolutely. Um, when last summer approached, I realized that um, in general in education, there seems to be a lack of um, relevance as to the work that we're asking our students to do. Uh, we have standards that we've adopted, that the state has adopted, and most states have standards that they adopt, whether they be um, their own set or a core curriculum that's being adopted by the nation right now. And we know what we want to teach our students. We just don't really have a lot of direction as to how. There's a lot of different programs out there, and um, despite the efforts being made by uh, education reform, there doesn't seem to be a lot of improvement in scores. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to get our students learning, and I wanted to have them learn in a way that was relevant to something. So I was thinking about the fact that uh, many American students right now, um, many American children, I should say, are unhealthy. There are large numbers of students that are obese and have high blood pressure and other health concerns that normally are not something that um, people worry about until they're older. And so I wanted to teach them a little bit about nutrition, And from that, it spiraled into an issue of um, food production. And then I started looking at community needs, and there seemed to be a large need, not just within our community, but um, across the nation, across the world, to feed people that um, were food, living in food insecure situations. So we decided as a school to create a garden that we can use to teach our students um, a number of issues about science and math um, and, in fact, even art we were talking about recently. And in that, they are producing food that we can donate to our uh, local food bank. And in addition to that, um, they're able to learn about nutrition because we're talking more about where our food comes from, um, what what chemicals may be used on foods that we eat and what it is that food actually does for our body. Well, that does sound like a great multidisciplinary approach. <laughs> it sounds yeah. really, really exciting, too. If I was a kid, it sounds like exactly what I'd want to be doing, you know, is getting outside and having, uh, you know, a varied way to get into that subject matter. So now, obviously, gardens grow quite a bit in the summer, and it's it's summer now, so yes. how does this kind of span, you know, the school year and what are the, some of the logistics of, of how the kids are involved and how it gets taken care of, you know, throughout the rest of the year? Okay. So since this was the first year, we actually, this spring was when we um, created the garden. So this past school year was um, all about brainstorming and actual creation of this garden. So this past year in the fall and winter months, we had students designing layouts. We had a competition for uh, the garden layout design. Um, We assigned tasks to varying grade levels that uh, were associated with whatever academic standards we felt um, they needed to address that wasn't going to be addressed by other curriculum at the school. Um, And then as spring approached, we had the students put into action everything that they planned throughout the winter and, and fall months. And When the summer approached, we had um, a lack of participation, mostly due to um, a lot of families traveling. So this summer, uh, my own children and I tended the garden since it's um, where it's located near the school where we work, where I work and where I live. Um, So we were able to do that. But next 
summer, um, we're going to be doing this a little bit differently. So this fall, when school starts, I'm going to be having a science club that meets during the fall semester. And in the spring semester, that, that science club is going to transition from a general science club to um, an outdoors uh, club uh, slash garden club. And so my, my goal, my hope, is that the students that are involved with that will sign up um, and be around a little bit more in the summer. So it's, it's more student involvement during the summer months when harvesting is going on and watering and that type of thing. Sounds like a great plan. So let's back up a minute and tell us a little bit about the academy. What are the ages of the kids there? Okay. Um, at Evacina, we have um, we start with preschool, and so those are our three- and four-year-olds, and we go all the way up to eighth grade this year. So we have students uh, spanning elementary and middle school. And so you were able to involve kids at, at every age at level? Every grade level That's they were great. involved, <laughs> every single grade level, um, and all of the teachers were involved. In fact, um, if they had spouses, all of their spouses were involved in some way or another. Um, we had uh, the little ones were um, investigating uh, earthworms and what it is that earthworms do for soil and how they help gardens and whatnot. Um, we had the older kids um, investigating different types of compost and how we can make our own compost piles and what compost does for gardens. We had some of our older kids actually um, designing not only the layout of the garden, but um, the the shed where they want to keep the tools for the garden, and and they were also <clears throat> excuse me they were also responsible for choosing the vegetables themselves. And then each grade level from preschool were able to plant the seeds that we started indoors. So everybody, um, each student was able to plant at least a couple seeds. Their parents were involved in planting. Um, anybody who ventured by the school during our planting days were actually um, able to plant some seeds that we started indoors. So everybody was invested. That's great. So with the design, can you tell us a little bit about the design? How big is the garden? Is it a raised bed garden? Or you know, what, what exactly is unique about it? Well, originally we had hoped to have a raised bed garden, and then um, I had conferred with some local people who had done some gardening locally, and um, they were telling me that we really didn't need to do raised bed gardens, that there were other ways to control weeds and whatnot. Um, so we abandoned that idea. The students, um, there were a couple of different design ideas that were submitted. Some of the students got pretty fancy with it. Um, and at the end of the day, when we were able to get out there um, right before we planted, they realized that um, maybe being fancy about the layout wasn't the best way to do it. There were more <laughs> practical ways to do it. So that was a learning experience. Um, the entire garden area, I want to say, is approximately 100 by 120 feet. Um, because this was our first year and um, because we were trying to see what it is that you know we were doing and how successful we would be, we were able to plant a little over um, half of that space. Um, part of that space we had reserved, and we're still working on that part, to create an outdoor um, classroom. We have tables that are going out there. We're going to do an out outdoor chalkboard um, type of thing so we can send our science classes and art classes out there, or if it's a beautiful day and just any other class wants to go out there, they can use it. Um, and the remainder of the garden that we didn't plant this year, um, we reserved for uh, tubers. We were going to be doing tuber towers for potatoes and uh, similar plants, but um, I don't know if we're going to get to those this year because I think we need to amend our soil a little bit more. So this kind of begs the question. It, it sounds like a great project, and you obviously put a lot of thought into how this garden could teach you know, the curriculum on a lot of different levels. What was your personal experience with gardening prior to this? I had zero, <laughs> zero personal experience with gardening prior to this. I had always been interested in it, um, but I was one of those people that whenever somebody bought me a plant, um, it promptly died. So this was kind of a personal challenge for me as well, and I, I was discussing this actually with my faculty prior to embarking on this. I said this is like... This is a dive into the deep end, but we have a really great team, and the students are really enthusiastic about learning. And I'm very fortunate with the people that you know we have here working with us that there was there was no hesitance on the part of anybody. Um, we've received help from everybody that we've turned to, and um, it's been a really interesting experience. And now, 
um, I love it. I'm very excited. I actually want to start my own personal garden. This year. <laughs> well, that's great. I think in a way that's that's really humbling and and very transparent of you to say, hey, I'm I'm the administrator. Or I'm the the teacher, and I don't know this. This is something I'll be learning along with the kids. Absolutely. So. Sounds like you've gotten a lot out of it, probably your kids and all the kids at the school. Yes. So so what is uh, growing in the garden right now? Well, I'll tell you what we planted. We planted um, melons and peppers, um, tomatoes, onions, zucchini, carrots, kohlrabi, strawberries, cucumber, and spinach. Um They all went into the ground, (laughs) and Mm -hmm. so far we have harvested um, zucchini, um, we have harvested cucumbers, we have harvested kohlrabi, and a few tomatoes. Our tomato plants um, showed stunted growth but somehow still yielded tomatoes, so I was very um, interested in that, actually. I want to look into that more. Um, We've so far not seen any peppers. Our um, spinach has withered and died and our celery hasn't really shown any growth at all. Okay. Well, it sounds like uh, you know you're getting you're getting a play here from the zucchini. Those are usually good uh, for production. And how how many pounds would you say you've you've produced so far? Um, I know that I've already um, we've already harvested probably up to now approximately seventy to eighty pounds. Wow. Um, and I would say today. Um, I could probably go out there and get another 15 to 20 pounds of um, cucumber and tomato. And you shared with me uh, the intention for all the produce from your garden is is very special, and it's part of your community mission. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, We decided, um, and I actually took this to the students and the faculty this year, um, the garden is a wonderful idea, and we are using it for teaching and, and to get the kids outside, which is necessary. Um, but one of the issues that we began addressing last year as a school and we're also carrying forward um, with us through the years is that there there is a need um, in the community for for food. And so I reached out to the um, Northwest the Food Bank of Northwest Indiana and I, I worked in particular very closely with Derek Frazier, who's the food procurement manager over there. And uh, we decided that we're going to donate 100% of um, the crops that we grow here. Uh, I originally wanted to hold on to some of the smaller, maybe some strawberries and some herbs, but um, our strawberries really didn't make it this year anyway, Mm -hmm. and the herbs never made it into the ground. So um, 100% of what we're growing this year is going to the food bank, and in in the years to come it will be very close to that um, because I want the students to um, have a firm understanding of the fact that we are part of something greater and that um, a lot of people out there don't have um, the things that we have. And so it's, you know, something that we should do is just help, and it should be a natural thing. I don't want it to be something that, you know, a lot of students, especially as they're in high school and whatnot, they feel like community service needs to be something that they put on their resume for college, which, you know, it is it is necessary and it's a good thing. But I want them to be able to understand that there is a true need and that even if it's not benefiting you, that's something you should do. Mm-hmm. Well, and tell us a little bit about the academy. It is it's a private school. Correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is it, is it co-ed? It is co-educational. Yes. Okay. And uh, we're located on um, Colorado Street. We're just south of the mall, a couple of miles. We're um, connected to the Northwest Indiana Islamic Center. So Avicenna Academy is a um, small private Islamic school. We're the only full-time Islamic school currently in Northwest Indiana. Um, our enrollment is, uh, it hovers somewhere between uh, 60 and 65 every year, preschool through um, eighth grade. And uh, we are we are talking about starting a high school at some point. Um, that's in the works, but right now we are preschool through eighth grade. And um, we offer our students, uh, it's very similar to any other religious private school where we have, um, you know, the general education um, subjects. We have, you know, English language arts and science and math and social studies and all of that. Um, We also offer um, classes that are pertinent to uh, the religious population that is the majority of the students that we serve. So we have um, Arabic classes, Arabic language. We offer um, Quran classes and Islamic studies classes as well. Now, 
One question I have for you is, do you think that the garden has allowed uh, the kids in the school to interact with the public and the you know greater community in a way that might not have been possible uh, without the garden? Um, it is. I, I noticed it starting, um, okay. and I'm hoping that it will continue. Okay. I know that um, we've done other programs here at the school that aren't related to the garden but are related to science that have done wonders for getting our kids out in the community and and having them talk to people that they weren't previously exposed to. Um, and I think, to be honest with you, um, I am I am myself, I'm the uh, administrator here, but I'm not Muslim. I, I'm not of the same faith as the majority of our students. Um, and I'm aware of the fact that there's a, a pervasive um, fear almost of, of um, people from the Middle East and, and Muslim people, especially in the you know post-9-11 um, environment. And it was important to me that our kids um, get out there and not be stunted by that and that they actually help the community around them to allay the fears that they may have um, about people like them. Well, I think that's great. I mean, it, it seems like whenever you break down a stereotype and get a chance to know somebody on a one-to-one -one level or work together on a project, I think 99 times out of 100, you'll see we have a whole lot more in common than we do, you know, with our differences. And, Absolutely. You know, I would just imagine that working together in a garden and, you know, doing something as honorable as, you know, feeding the hungry would give the kids a lot of opportunities to just kind of, you know, rub shoulders with people that they might not otherwise come into contact with. So I hope that continues to be a, a positive experience for all involved. Okay. Uh, that's that's great. And uh, well, it sounds like a lot of good plans. Um, tell me how, how some of these other objectives, you said you wanted to find curriculum that was you know, hands-on, relevant, and that spoke to issues of health and nutrition. What kinds of uh, things do you think have come out of the garden so far that have helped address those uh, goals? Um, well, I guess Starting um, on a personal level, my own children and I, when we started doing the work for this garden, um, started researching a lot about nutrition, and we changed our diet. Um, we used to be omnivor omnivores, um, and currently we are vegan. Um, so we have carried what we've learned about plant-based diets through to the school here. And um, one of my teachers was just telling me yesterday that um, she noticed that in, in her class that she was teaching, where one of my daughters was a student, that the snack foods that the kids would bring in changed from chips um, and Dorito type things to um, fruits and vegetables, and that instead of bringing sodas in, they were bringing in um, water and and juices that didn't have like added sugar to them. And so I think the students, especially the older ones, are kind of picking up on the fact that um, there are healthier ways to eat. Um, in addition, we've added something to, uh, we have morning announcements every morning, and every single morning we address um, a nutritional issue. We either uh, introduce a fruit or a vegetable and talk to the kids about what is in it and what those nutrients help us do, um, or we talk about uh, the latest research um, about food and, and medical issues that have, you know, has popped up in the news. And so all of our kids across the grade levels every morning are getting um, information from the office, and then each of my teachers has developed um, a health program that this year we were actually talking about. We're adding calisthenics to our classrooms. Um, every week they're going to be doing exercises with their students, and um, they're going to be addressing food issues um, much more often during lunchtime and during snack time with the students in class. I know that we've talked to the parents several times about, um, you know, making healthy foods available to their children instead of just convenient foods that may be, you know, high in sugars. Um, and that seems to be that seems to be taking effect. The, I know the, some of the snacks I've seen the kids come in with at the younger grade levels even are much healthier. That's great. That's amazing. All of this coming from you know one one initiative. Uh, you mentioned also uh, besides the science that lessons from the garden were also creeping into math and even art. I'm just yeah. wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, with math, a lot of that was um, at the beginning when we were trying to figure out how much space we want to use um, for the garden itself and how much space each plant is going to need 
Um, we did a lot of the um, geometry type lessons where you talk about volume and area with our students. We we did it using actual soil. Um, we had a lot of our older kids, um, fifth grade and up, I believe it was, went out there and tested the soil, and while they were out there, were able to do a lot of measurements and whatnot, so it helped them with those skills. Um, and with art, we are um, hoping to build up that classroom area pretty quickly here, and once that's up, the kids will be able to go out there and sit, and if, they, um, if they're doing lessons on painting or chalk or charcoal or whatnot, they'll have actual nature to look at to be able to do those, those types of things. Well, that's great. I mean, it sounds like an awful lot has come out of it in just uh, about a year so far from beginning to where we are. And I'm sure the kids are going to be in for a big surprise to see the garden in, in bloom when they come back. And anything planned for that uh, first week of school, how to get the kids reinvolved? Um, we were actually just uh, brainstorming about this yesterday, the teachers and I, in a meeting, and um I, don't, I know that we had originally thought about maybe having a garden party, and so we might do that. And uh, I might actually open up the idea to the students and see if they come up with some sort of plan to get us all involved again. Um, that's one of the things that I think is very important is um, not just dictating what gets done, but actually opening up um, to suggestions from the students. And believe it or not, the, the actual garden layout we have now um, it was all student designed. They they ended up having a competition, but the one that won, they decided that they were going to use um, an easier one, and they collaborated on that all together. And they came up with the, the layout we have now. And so I found that when I um, when I leave it up to them, they actually get a lot more done than than I would have come up with on my own. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm thinking I haven't heard a whole lot about teaching gardens in northwest Indiana. Do you have any idea how common or uncommon this is right now? Um, I actually, you know, I, I want to say that when I started researching um, school gardens, there were a few, but I, not in this area that I found. I know that there are community gardens around here, and um, originally that's what we were calling our garden is community garden, but it's not... It's not so much a community garden in that most community gardens have, you know, plots of land that are given to individual families or groups. And um, we don't really do that. We're kind of all working in the same space um, for a common goal. So it is a teaching garden. I don't, as far as I know, in this general area of the state, there is none like that. Mm -hmm. And other school gardens, I don't believe, function the same way ours does. They seem to be pretty, um, they seem to be much smaller, first of all, and they also seem to be... Um, their goals are more, um, they're very geared toward, you know, we're going to watch this particular plant grow type of situation, mm -hmm. whereas ours is a little more open than that. Do you have advice for teachers or administrators that would like to get a garden uh, such as this started in their own school? Um, my advice would be, first of all, um, don't think about it too much. If you're going to do it, do it. Um, and to reach out into the community and to ask people. Ask the town that your school is located in. Um, get online and start looking to see if there are some local groups um, or, or individuals that are willing to work with people. Um, there are master gardeners available. There's a list of master gardeners available online, I believe, that you can find pretty easily. And there's always somebody out there that's willing to help and that has the knowledge and has the desire to um, grow a garden, and I think you know this is probably one of the easiest projects I've ever done because it is it is such a um, it's becoming more and more popular, which is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of people out there that are willing to help. Would you like to name any of the partners that kind of helped uh, get you started? Either people in the community or organizations. Absolutely, um, we worked um, like I said, we worked with the uh, India Northwest Indiana Food Bank. Um, and Derek Frazier actually gave me the names of some individuals. Um, Chuck Gleason was one of those, and he works with Grow and WI. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Gleason also put me in touch with Master Gardener Monica Conway, who did um, a lot of work with me. We had a lot of uh, we spent a lot of time sitting down and talking, and uh, she also donated the majority of the seeds that we used for our plants. Um, Ryan, Ryan Richardson also works with Grow NWI. Um, uh, he and Monica were able to get um, some people out here to help us till up the ground 
um, that needs to be done because the, ground, the garden area where the garden currently is wasn't um, grown on in years. Um, and then we also worked with Matt Lake from the town of Maryville. Um, he was able to, to donate some mulch and compost and um, advice on the garden itself, and we've had, you know, wonderful success so far. So I'm very grateful to all of them. Good. And uh, Laura at the Legacy Foundation was the one who pointed me in, in your direction. Were they involved in the project at all? Yes, they were. Um, Laura, especially over there, and, and the Legacy Foundation did. Um, they helped so much. They helped me with um, meeting some of the people that I had to be in touch with. Um, we, uh, we submitted a grant to them, and we were granted money to help us on our way. Um, and without them, we wouldn't be where we are. So they were, by and large, the biggest help to us. Good. Well, that sounds like a good roadmap for anybody that's out there thinking about it is get involved with your community foundation. As you said, the town people, you know, in the area where your garden is located, Grow NWI does cover a really wide service area. And I do know Ryan and Chuck and Monica, all the people that you mentioned. And in fact, I'm going to put out a little uh, blurb for an event that they are involved in and I'm also involved in. It's coming up uh, this Saturday, the 18th, August 18th, and it's part of a statewide initiative that is sponsored by Sustainable Indiana 2016 in an effort to get Indiana a whole lot greener by our bicentennial year, which is 2016. Uh, one of the big initiatives for this year is to shine a light on gardens, um, and we're going to be hosting, I think, 44 different garden parties on Saturday throughout the region 40-something of them are ones that Grow NWI have had a personal hand in. So many of them are at Boys and Girls Clubs. They're at churches. They're at all different places. Uh, Trinity Baptist in Gary will be kind of the showcase uh, party over in Lake County. I'll be hosting one at Foundation Meadows Park in Valparaiso, where I live, and I'm part of that community garden. That will be at, from 3 to 5 uh, p.m. on Saturday. And you can go to Sustainable Indiana. 2016.org to find out where all these garden parties are. There are also some in LaPorte County and really all across the state. So if it's something that you're thinking about, you'd like to know more about gardening, there will be people on hand, probably master gardeners, uh, some people from Grow NWI, and just people that are anxious to share their information and get you started. So whether you're thinking of a backyard garden, a school garden, anything like that, just come on out and ask questions. Uh, people that are involved with these types of things really want to help you and get you pointed in the right direction. So Amanda, I'm just curious. Uh, it sounds like this has been a really big success. Will you continue this garden next year and beyond? Absolutely, absolutely. This is it's long term for us. Um, and, you know, the things that we've learned this year, we will apply this coming year. So, as I said, we will be amending the soil a little bit more. Um, we're going to be a little more uh, vigilant against weeds and um, come up with a, a better solution to watering. Um, but, yeah, it's a long-term goal for us. It's, it's here, and we're going to be working it for a while. Well, good. I hope we will stay in touch, and I'd love to see pictures posted of uh, the progress, if that's something that you'll be putting on your school site. Is it okay to go ahead and give out website for your your school? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's www.avicennaacademy.org. And so you can find out more about the school, more about Amanda, and uh, hopefully we'll see some gallery photos of their beautiful garden here before too long. Well, Amanda, it has been a pleasure having you today. And if, if you're just joining us, again, I'm host Kathy Sipple with 219 Green Connect, and my guest today is... Uh, out of school, Amanda Arceo at Avicenna Academy in Crown Point, and we've been talking about their teaching garden. If you'd like to catch the rest of the show, please visit 219greenconnect.com or look for us on iTunes, and you can check out our podcast. Thank you very much. This is the end of the episode.